All right, so now is the time to introduce you to our next speaker, Ian Hamilton. He's an accessibility specialist and uh, congrats, by the way, yesterday on the Game Awards, uh, he was uh, I'll mention among so many awesome people. Uh, so that was super cool. And I know there were a lot of uh, questions in the chat about uh, <clears throat> the Game Awards. I, I could not watch the Game Awards <laughs> because I was preparing the summit, uh, but I, I saw a lot of reactions uh, around accessibility. And, and so uh, I'm sure Ian, is gonna um, uh, want to uh, react on that. So Ian, can you join us? I saw you in the panelist. Here you go. How you doing? Good, good, very good, thank you. Yeah. So uh, how are things going for you? You're in um, you're in the UK, correct? Um, ish. Yeah, I'm having to travel. <laughs> okay. Which has its own adventures at the moment. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit what, what you do, introduce yourself, and then I just, I'm just going to close and, you know, shut yes, down my, my video and, and, and shut up so that you can, you can uh, do your thing. Thanks, Ian, so cool. much for, uh, for being here. Cool. Um, so, yeah, my name is Ian. I am an accessibility specialist. Um, so that means that I work um, to help avoid the barriers that can unnecessarily exclude people with disabilities um, or have a have negative impact on people's ex um, uh, player experience. Um, I've been doing this for a while now, for um, about 14 years. I'm working in game accessibility, and in that time, I have seen the field um, grow and change um, a lot. Um, over the past year, um, things have taken a bit of a knock. Um, because, of, because of COVID, I've seen all kinds of um, nice initiatives be cancelled or postponed um, because of the the economic and the organizational impact that the virus has had on people's plans. Um, but one sector in particular that's taken the real knock is charities. Um, obviously losing out on their opportunities for the usual like face-to-face -face fundraising and stuff. So this um, slide just before I start is an example of some of the charitable organizations that um, have been making a tremendous difference to the games industry. Um, the industry wouldn't be um, where it is today um, without the work of these organizations. So if it is within your means, um, please consider um, donating to some of these organizations because it really is the hour of need. But despite the setbacks that are, there have been, um, it has still been a really tremendous year for progress in accessibility. So I'm going to give you um, a bit of a summary of, of some of the things that have happened. Um, it is just an overview of a few kind of highlights um, that we passed the point a few years ago of being able to talk about all the cool stuff um, in the space of a single talk, um, which is a nice milestone to hit. But yes, yeah, so this is just a few highlights of some of the cool things that have happened in accessibility over the past year, um, covering these areas, um, hardware, information, events, games, and hires. So starting with hardware, there have been some nice things that have happened with um, input devices. Um, starting with this one, this is something that's called the Freedom Wing Adapter. The Freedom Wing adapter is a um, bit of kit that sits in between some gaming equipment and a powered wheelchair. And this was um, the brainchild of Steve Spawn of Able Gamers. And that's actually um, who you're looking at in this photo. So you can see up the top of the screen there, um, that's actually his fingers on the joystick of his powered chair. That's then being routed through to the green box, which is the Freedom Wing which is then hooked up to an Xbox adaptive controller, which you can see on the floor there, which then can hook up to, to a PC or an Xbox. Meaning that you can actually use your existing hardware, your existing joystick that you have on your power chair to actually now control games. So in this photo, he was actually playing Rocket League using the joystick on his power chair. This was another really, really lovely example. Um, this is a set of accessibility switches that were brought out by uh, Logitech. So in the background, again, is an Xbox adaptive controller. What the adaptive controller is, is basically an adapter to allow people to um, plug in whatever inputs they want instead of the usual controller inputs that they might not be able to use. That type of input is something that's called an accessibility switch, which is basically just a um, three and a half mil mini jack on one end. On the other end, anything at all that just sends a simple on off signal open and closes a circuit. So that could be anything from a button to press, a cheat to blow into an infrared blink detector, anything that sends that simple signal. That's a really simple and powerful um, standard. 
but it's really expensive. Um, so it, it, even just with like a single simple button um, it starts at about $25, $30 and goes upwards in cost very, very quickly. What Logitech did was release this kit, um, which has about a dozen or so um, different uh, switches and button uh, switches of different kind of configurations, like like small like touch ones, the bigger ones at the front, and released the entire kit of all those switches, plus the mounting boards, plus stickers um, for $100. So that combined with the reduction in cost of the Xbox adapter controller, which cut the cost of the adapter itself down from about $400 to $100, um, those two things combined is a really, really incredible democratization of people's access to accessibility technology. And because it's made by Logitech, um, that means that it's actually um, built to a really high standard, has got really good support and stuff, something that wasn't really available before in the assistive technology marketplace. And this, this is the Hori Flex. Um, this just hit very recently. This is an equivalent to the Xbox adaptive controller built for the Nintendo Switch, um, released by Hori. Um, it's only been produced in quite small numbers so far, and it's only available in Japan, but it's really, really nice to see um, this, again, the democratization of tech. Um, and not just by traditional assistive technology makers, um, much like Logitech, like Xbox, Hori are just like a regular um, gaming peripheral maker. So it's really, really exciting to see these traditional manufacturers branching out into accessibility technology. And still on the topic of Switch, um, in, in terms of the actual systems themselves, there have been accessibility updates to those as well. Um, this was the system level button mapping functionality that was released for the Switch early this year. Really, really nice, really powerful. Um, something really important to mention, though, is that this is for the benefit of players. It's not for the benefit of developers. So it's there only as a fallback for games that haven't got their own remapping. It's much, much better to include remapping yourself. Um, and Xbox in particular say this repeatedly, like this is no substitute for in-game remapping. So even though this stuff is really cool and really helps people, please, please don't rely on it yourselves. Think about remapping, uh, including remapping directly in games. And the other systems have been having updates as well. So this is actually for Google Stadia. Um, it's basically equivalent to the functionality on Xbox called Copilot. And what both of them do is allow two controllers to be chained together and operate as a single controller. Um, so this has a whole bunch of different benefits. Um, like for example, you might be um, playing with a little kid and taking over some of the controls for them. Um, but what it's actually designed for is accessibility as a way to split um, the controls between two different locations on the same body. Um, so for example, if you've only got one hand, you could have um, a controller in one hand operating one side of it and operate the other side of a second controller with your foot. Um, or you could, for example, be operating the sticks of a controller with your thumbs and don't have any fingers and operating the buttons um, by some switches like uh, located around your feet. This enables all this kind of stuff. Xbox as well, Xbox and PlayStation, they kind of um, slowed down a bit um, because obviously the new platforms were about to arrive. They were kind of a bit busy with that, um, but they still did some nice things um, like this, for example, this was earlier this year, an update for the Xbox that allowed players to configure where they wanted the system notifications to appear. Um, so this may seem like a fairly trivial thing, but actually this is really critically important because before this update, the notifications appeared at the bottom in the middle which is exactly where subtitles are. So this made an enormous difference to a, a, a very, very wide range of people. And then of course we have the new platforms um, and they both really, really pushed the bar in completely the opposite way. So PS5, they pushed the bar in terms of um, features they added. Um, they added a whole bunch of nice accessibility stuff, in particular, a fully, functional screen reader, um, which is the technology that blind people use to have interfaces read out to them. And um, that's now present on the PlayStation 5 across the entire of the system UI and localized into tons of different languages as well. That was a really big step for PlayStation. Um, Xbox um, pushed the bar by keeping things the same. Um, not only did they um, keep um, all exactly the same feature set as they have from the previous generation, the controllers are backwards compatible. That is a huge, huge step, and one that I don't think has been seen in the games industry for, for quite a few console generations, the ability to use your old controllers. Um, why that's so important for accessibility is because of the custom hardware that people often use. 
Um, it can even just like a regular um, Xbox controller that's been adapted to use with one hand, like shifting the joystick to the bottom so you can push it with your leg, that kind of thing. They can be really, really expensive, cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And normally each time a new generation comes out, that's it, game over, you've got to start again. Um, but now because they've actually allowed um, the uh, Xbox controllers from the previous generation to work with this generation of Xboxes, um, that cost um, doesn't need to be incurred again. Um, that includes obviously the Xbox adaptive controller um, that can still be used with the current generation. So that's really, really nice to see. It's kind of a step towards where I'd love to see the industry get to, which is actually some proper open standards, letting people use whatever device they want, uh, input device they want with whichever hardware they want. That's a bit of a pipe dream, but well, we can dream, can't we? So next up, information. So this, this covers two things. Um, firstly, information for developers. Um, Oculus very recently actually released a set of uh, VR accessibility guidelines. Um, they're fairly light touch. Um, they just cover, I think it's a seven or eight key things. But if you actually click through, there's a lot of detailed supporting information, which goes into some really nice, uh, nice uh, design strategies and techniques as well. So I definitely recommend checking these out. Xbox, um, Xbox last year um, publicly released their uh, Xbox accessibility guidelines. So that was um, basically the, the internal guidelines that they produced for use by their first party studios. They actually released those publicly for anyone to make use of. And what they've done since then is develop a load of supporting video content. And it's these little animated videos. Um, that's Brandon Zahan there from Xbox in animated form. I'm sure a few people watching know Brandon. Um, these videos are really, really nice. Um, they're like one and a half minute long animated shorts on like a single topic of accessibility. Really nice, like just the perfect level of like length and detail, a nice bite size snippet. So these are really, really cool. Please look at them. Um, if you look at the uh, Microsoft Enable YouTube channel, they have a playlist on there with um, all them in. There's about 10 or so and they're continuing adding new ones. The other side of progress for information has been information for players. This is the um, Family Video Game Database. Um, this is primarily aimed at giving parents information on age suitability of games um, when they're looking to buy things for their kids. But as part of that, they actually have got a really detailed system of um, accessibility information, detailing what kind of features there are in the games. And this is all driven by um, the guy who, um, who runs and maintains this site. And also he has a small army of um, accessibility helpers as well, helping to populate that information. This is another source of information for gamers. And um, this is information on storefronts. Um, this is Google Stadia. So Stadia had been doing a ton of nice accessibility stuff. Like I said, that, uh, that um, tandem feature earlier. Um, they actually now have um, quite detailed information on accessibility directly within the storefront. Every single game on the Stadia storefront actually has a panel on there um, for developers to populate with information about what accessibility features they have. Um, this has been something that people have been crying out for and campaigning for for many, many years. So um, it's really, really nice to see progress um, actually happening on this front. And studios have also been um, providing more detailed information as well. So this is something that really, really kicked off in the past kind of year or two. Um, uh, the, the first few studios actually starting to publish detailed accessibility information directly um, on their own websites. And um, that's expanded a lot this year. Firstly, in terms of um, the, the number of companies that are doing it, um, companies like Activision now and um, like PlayStation as well now doing it. But what's been really, really nice to see has been the time at which this information is being provided. Um, so if you have a look at this, this um, if you look on the left hand side, um, this was the accessibility information for uh, Phoenix Rising. Um, the date on there is September the 10th. So they actually published information about the accessibility functionality in the game a full three months before the game's launched. And this is, is so important to have um, accessibility information available early because um, it's pretty hard to get excited and hyped about a game if you have no idea whether you're even gonna be able to play it. So seeing the date at which that information is provided creeping back and back further in development, earlier in development is, is really, really nice. And I can understand as well, the pressures on people not wanting to overcommit and that kind of stuff. So it's quite a big ask to give that kind of detail that early in development. So it's been lovely to see progress being made on that. 
And another part of that, that, that hype and being um, caught up in the culture and stuff around it um, is your media that goes around it as well. So like your trailers, your teaser videos. And in the course of 2020, we started to see um, several companies actually starting to include audio description for their trailers. So if you're not familiar with the audio description, it's um, extra content that's provided um, for blind viewers. Um, so for example, what you're looking at here, um, when there's a gap in the dialogue, a separate narrator would jump in and say um, like, a, a gang of three people is walking through a flowery field, looking at birds flying overhead, something like that. So the blind people can actually understand the visual context of what's going on. Um, so traditionally, this has had to be a separate video. Um, YouTube um, have actually been working on functionality within the YouTube player um, that you click on the settings button and then you can actually choose which audio track you want within that video. Um, so you can actually have audio description as well as localization as well um, within the same video. And the very first video um, to ever use that functionality was the trailer for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, so this makes me so, so happy seeing um, not just progress within the games industry, but actually the, the things that the games industry are pushing for actually helping to drive accessibility across other industries as well. Events. Um, this is the first event I'm going to tell you about. This is a it's a game development platform called um, Crater. Uh, Crater run a game jam in the summer um, aimed at getting people to try out making games using their platform. And the person that won it um, was a girl called Becky. Um, Becky was actually the person who Special Effect worked with um, to develop the, the iGaze version of Minecraft. Um, so she uses iGaze to interact um, to interact with technology. And since those Minecraft days, she's now actually working in Creator. She won the game jam. Um, she is now a budding game developer herself. Um, so her game development career has actually been kickstarted um, by the efforts made for accessibility of games. In terms of game jams, um, the Daddy is Global Game Jam. Um, Global Game Jam um, every year has um, a bunch of accessibility um, op like optional criteria that people can, can choose to take up if they want to. They're taken up by tens of thousands of developers every year. It's a really tremendous awareness raising exercise, um, especially as so many people taking part in Global Game Jam um, are students and people who are early in their careers who can find this kind of experience, hands-on experience of accessibility really, really valuable. Um, that changed a little bit this year. They did something new, um, something called the Accessibility Funds. Um, this is something that's not going to be relevant this year, um, but um, for the January Girl Game Jam, um, they basically had a fund, um, like generous donors um, donating money, which could then be sent out to the physical Global Game Jam venues um, all around the world to be spent on actually upgrading those venues um, to make them more physically accessible to disabled participants. So that was when um, events were still taking place in person. Um, obviously, then COVID happened and events started moving online. And um, with that, um, the thinking that um, companies have been starting to put into accessibility of real world events actually translate across into online as well. Um, so things like um, Ubisoft and uh, Microsoft's um, showcase events, um, they had captioning, um, audio description, sign language, um, all kinds of nice stuff. Um, it was even taken a bit further with um, Ubisoft. They actually sent out copies um, of the games they were showcasing to um, disabled influencers and review sites um, so they could actually um, share directly with their communities as well. And of course, that resulted in um, a whole bunch of nice um, feedback from those players and what they were saying as well, um, some of which made it directly into the game. So I think um, both uh, Watchdog Legions and Valhalla, they both had um, accessibility functionality in their game directly from that feedback from that event. And as Celia mentioned, um, the Game Awards. Um, so the Game Awards actually did a few things. Um, so first off, on, on, on that note of those other events that we were just talking about, um, the Game Awards um, last night had a um, audio described stream. So this was actually live audio description. Um, they had one doing a really good job of actually of, um, of describing all the stuff like for this example, just describing that he is getting up on stage, waving his hands around the front of a big flashy screen. Um, she was doing all that kind of stuff um, live in real time. It was really, really nice. 
They also had um, the thing that Cillian mentioned, which was um, the feature class, which was um, choosing um, a bunch of people to recognize who they saw as um, helping to push the industry in a good direction. Um, that was a group of 50 people that they chose. And of those 50 people, um, 10 of them were accessibility -ers. Um, like a whole 20% of that list were people on there for working accessibility, which was quite incredible to see. And um, for the first time, they introduced an award specifically for innovation in accessibility, um, which was won by The Last of Us 2. And they confirmed last night as well that that is going to be an ongoing thing, a permanent addition to the Game Awards, recognizing developers um, work to include people with disabilities. Um, this isn't the first time that a mainstream award ceremony has um, included an accessibility award, um, the accessibility category. There have been other examples like the um, Tiger Awards in the UK and the AGDAs in Australia that have done this previously. Um, but this is a whole other ballgame. Um, the Game Awards um, gets like tens of millions of viewers worldwide. So that is just an incredible um, amount of awareness raising that is being done through this awareness raising um, amongst developers about the kind of things that are possible, but also awareness raising amongst all the gamers that are watching as well um, of, of, of um, what is being done. And also a statement being made um, to disabled gamers as well, saying, you know, we recognize you, we, 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 we equally value you as much as any other players as well. It's a really powerful public statement to make by the industry. Um, so that brings me on to the games themselves. Um, and like I just said, Last of Us 2 um, took the award at the Game Awards, um, deservedly so. They did a whole bunch of nice stuff, um, including um, being the first AAA game that was purposefully designed from the ground up to be accessible to gamers who are completely blind. And, and what was really nice about that is you might think, wait a second, like a, like a third person action adventure game for people who are blind, that's some pretty crazy niche stuff going on there. It's not at all. Literally every single thing that they did for blind accessibility was used by other players as well because it was just good, useful quality of life stuff. So it's a really powerful lesson from that. They did loads of other nice stuff as well. Um, they had about, well, it, it's not about the number of features um, because ultimately a feature is only a workaround for a barrier that you put in the game. Um, but having said that, they did include like 60 different accessibility features. They did a ton of good work and they were very open as well about what their secret source was. Um, the secret source was simply um, that they thought about it from early in development because um, their, their first real foray into accessibility was with um, Uncharted 4. And with Uncharted 4, they did some cool stuff, but their reaction, as it always is, was, damn, if only I'd thought about this earlier, um, we could have done so much cool stuff. Um, and at that time, The Last of Us 2 was in the early stages of development, so they were able to think about it early. They were able to engage with the community from the early days, and they were able to do, um, do much more stuff and do it to a much higher standard. But it isn't just about The Last of Us 2. Um, so I'm going to cheat here and just read something off my phone. Um, so... And this, is actually, this talk is actually the last time that you ever do this, and you'll see why in a second. So, so I'm just going to give you a quick list of, this isn't exhaustive either, this is just some of the games that have been doing really nice innovative stuff in accessibility over the past year. Um, Hyperdot, Trine 4, Cook Serve Delicious 3, Dreams, Scourge Bringer, Veritas, Path of Giants, Zombie Army 4, Dark Siders Genesis, Bleeding Edge, um, the Outer Worlds, Moving Out, Doom Eternal, Lair of the Clockwork Gods, Freedom Finger, Half-Life Alex, Predator Hunting Grounds, Gears Tactics, Minecraft Dungeons, Jedi Fallen Order, Before I Forget, Sea of Thieves, Space Wave Race, Cave Story, Jet Lance, A Wildfire, Destiny 2, Last of Us 2, Chicken Police, Boots on the Moon, Hades, Sento Showdown, Spin Rhythm, Paradise Killer, Overcooked, Ghost of Tsushima, Grounded, Hyperscape, Avengers, Watch Dogs Legion, Control, Untold, Tell Me Why, Waltz of the Wizard, Tony Hawk's, Phenotopia, Wasteland 3, Brunch Club, Going Under, Scarlet Hollow, x Taze, Candy Crush Friends, Crash Brand Coop 4, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Ickenfell, FIFA 21, NHL 21, Star Wars Squadrons, Kingdom Hearts, Melody and Memory, Spider-Man, Mars Morales, Black Ops, Cold War, Phoenix Rising. To be able to read a list like that is, like I said, it's not even exhaustive is incredible. Um, any one of those games, if it had come out only like two, three years ago, would have been would have been incredible, incredible news, just even that one game coming out. So to get to that point where it is just 
a part of the day-to-day -day fabric and making games now. And that's across the whole industry. Like that, that stuff on that list was everything from the biggest AAAs down to, to like um, solo indies. And the solo indies are still doing some of the most innovative stuff as well. Um, so it's really, really nice to, to, to be able to get to that point where I can now say that that's literally the last time I'm doing one of those lists because it is too many now. And how this comes about um, is due to people. And um, that is increasingly meaning people for whom accessibility is their full-time role. Um, so there's now, um, I think, about kind of 30, 35 or so people in full-time dedicated um, in-house um, accessibility roles. Um, like five years ago, there was like two, I think. Um, and all the, all these um, all these logos up on the screen, um, these are people who have actually um, specifically um, hired or created roles for accessibility in the past year. Um, there is one here that stands out, which is Unity. Um, so Unity didn't just hire a person, um, they put Abbott's out for hiring an accessibility team. So they actually now have an entire accessibility team. And that team is there to fill two functions. Um, firstly, to work on functionality to help um, developers make their games accessible. Um, secondly, actually to work on the accessibility of the Unity editor itself for disabled developers. And they need input from developers on both of those things. So if, you have, if you're working with Unity yourself, or even if you're not, um, if you have any thoughts at all about um, ways that um, Unity um, could um, make some efforts in either of those two areas, please, please um, get in touch with them. Um, if you don't have like a, a good contact with Unity already, um, drop me a line and I can tell you exactly who to talk to about that. Um, so hopefully this is, like I said, it's just a little whistle-stop overview of a few highlights, but um, hopefully you can see that the, the, the position we're at now is one of, um, of really strong, um, rock-solid foundations. Um, there's still a long way to go. Um, we're still a long way off from, um, well, we're still a way off from someone being able to pick up a game and even have the basics covered, you know, the basics like um, text size, subtitles, uh, remapping, um, effects intensity. Um, we're still a way off from any game, actually, any AAA game actually acing all those things. Um, hopefully we'll get to that point this year. And we're still a very long way off from the point where anyone can pick up any game and have a reasonable expectation that they'll be able to play it. Um, but like I said, we have rock solid foundations in place now. It's just a case on, of keeping that momentum going and building upon those foundations and, and hopefully taking the industry to um, realizing its full potential. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, that was uh, that was really uh, insightful. And um, I was uh, trying to look at the Q and A section. Um, there were so the, the there were some uh, questions about the Game Awards, but you already addressed that. Do we have any more questions about uh, Ian's talk? So if you could type it in the Q and A section, so that is going to be much easier for me than if you, because I, it's hard for me to look at the chat. Um, so I'm just looking. Okay. So we have a question here. What do you think about the possibilities for accessibility in mobile games? Cool. And I can see down the bottom, there's another question about mobile games as well. So I'll answer them both together. Um, a lot of the accessibility accommodations for mobile games are um, the same as for other platforms. Um, there are some differences, one being the, the greater impact of um, situational impairment. Um, so if, for example, you are um, playing a game on um, power saving mode or um, you're playing in direct sunlight, um, in those instances, the, the accommodations you'll have made for people with low vision will be really, really helpful. Um, the main difference is, uh, is really in, um, in input, um, so talking about touch screen. Um, but it's the same kind of principles apply. So if you're talking about um, PC or console gaming, um, you're really talking about avoiding unnecessary complexity and you're talking about offering flexibility. Those two things apply on mobile as well. So in terms of avoiding necessary complexity, that's basically talking about the type of gestures you're using. There's a sliding scale going from simple taps um, all the way up to like complex multi-touch gestures. Um, so the more you can push it down towards the other end, um, the more accessible it's going to be. Um, and that can be at the same, like simultaneously as well. I think a nice example um, of that is um, Angry Birds. If you're going through the level select from Angry Birds, there's an arrow on either side. You can use a simple tap. Um, you can also swipe. So you can actually offer both at the same time. 
And then in terms of um, flexibility, um, that can be in terms of like the hit areas um, that you use for virtual controls, um, choice of different input methods. Um, a really nice example of that was a game called Into the Dead, which is a um, first person endless runner, where basically you're running um, through a field of zombies and have to dodge either side to get out of the way if they try and eat you. Um, through most of the development, the controls for that was gyroscope, tilting from side to side to dodge. Um, at the end of development, um, close to the end, their um, user researcher, a guy called um, Hadley Bellum, if anyone watches knows him, um, he, he brought up the issue of, well, actually, some people can't physically pick up a tablet and play like laying flat on the surface. Other people don't have the strength and coordination to accurately tilt it. Um, the team was like, yep, yeah, fair enough. We hadn't thought about that. OK, so, so they actually, actually added in some flexible controls. So as well as tilt, they actually had the option to um, uh, control it using a left button, uh, button on either side of the screen for left and right. They also implemented the option for a left-handed um, virtual stick and the option for a right-handed virtual stick. And um, obviously this was just through altruism, you know, they knew that, that tilt was the fun one, that everyone who could choose tilt would. Um, this was just for a very small number of people who couldn't. Um, but then Hadley actually checked the usage data and it was actually 25%, 25, 25, 25. Like um, what they thought was an altruistic gesture for a small number of people had actually made the game a better experience for the 75% of their players who preferred not to use Tilt. Um, and in terms sorry, of- Sorry to, to cut you off, Ian. I'm just looking at, at yeah. the time. It's like, oh, it's 45. <laughs> so I'm sorry, we're going to have to wrap it up uh, since we have a long day of, uh, of other um, 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 panels and, and talks. Um, I saw, I, I really wanted you to, if like really quickly, like in 10 seconds, to, can, can you just um, talk about, is it difficult to establish accessibility option across different languages? Um, it, they actually kind of tie into each other. Because um, if you're talking about, um, it, it really comes down to um, uh, subtitling. So if you're catering for um, like Germanic languages and stuff, um, things that have like really long words, if you're actually taking into account good accessibility practices for configurable subtitle presentation, the, the two things actually tie in and support each other. Um, apart from that, it's not so much of a localization. There is a bit of a cultural issue with like different, different countries' attitudes towards accessibility that comes into it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah I know that. that. Kate, Kate Edwards uh, talks a lot about culturalization and then thinking about you know what what means something to in in one country or one culture it doesn't mean the same thing in another culture and, and can even be offensive um yeah. all and, right and so disability different countries attitudes towards disability can affect you know the developers attitudes yeah. towards accessibility as well yeah thank you um, so, so much Ian for for as well one last thing um jason's question about the last slide of the games companies within the house accessibility teams that's not actually what that slide was that was um the companies that have hired new people this year so there are actually a bunch of other companies as well Sweet. Thank you so much, Ian, uh, for your time.